This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. And welcome everybody to a special episode of the Animaniacast. Don't buzz in until you can say the answer. The answer? Very well. The answer is what? It is? What was the question? I don't know. Then don't buzz in. I didn't buzz in! Then you can't answer the question. Do you think this is funny? Yes! And welcome, everybody, once again to the Animaniacast. This is the only podcast that is dedicated to the animated television series, Animaniacs. And, of course, here we talk about every single episode. And we talk about all the gags and all the references and all that stuff. And, of course, we give each episode a Water Tower rating. Not only that, but we also talk about Pinky Brain, Tiny Toon Adventures, and Freakazoid. But today... We have a very special episode because we're going to be playing a little bit of a game, I guess you could say. So, I am Joey, and joining me once again are my co-hosts, it's Nathan. Good answer. (laughs) Across the country in Georgia, it's Kelly. Hello. And our honorary fourth co-host, it's, oh, I don't know, he's known as a lot of things, but in this case, he's known as the creator of Animaniacs, it's our good friend, Mr. Tom Ruger. Hello, nurses. Hi. <laughs> Hello there, Tom. Well, this is this is an exciting event, uh, especially because it falls around, this is like the fourth anniversary of our show, actually. Wow. We've, we've been doing this show for four years. Wow. And... It lasted longer than my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> 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 the, uh, we have we have a, a special event today because Tom said to us, uh, "Why don't we go over some of the things that are put up on IMDb and just various places the internet uh, are saying these are Animaniacs facts, and some of them are true and some of them are not so true, and some of them are just com- I bet are just completely false." So Tom's provided this list. So we're going to play a little bit of a game today. Uh, And we're going to be calling it Animaniacs. Those are the facts. Those are the facts. And joining us, of course, is Nathan, contestant Uh, one. True. Uh, False. Uh, Oh, shoot. (laughs) Contestant number two, it's Kelly. I'm not answering any questions. I'm watching Baywatch. (laughs) And... (laughs) Uh, and of course, the creator of Animaniacs, our special judge to find out fact from fiction, it's Mr. Tom Ruger. Well, I actually didn't know Baywatch was on, so I'm a little conflicted now. <laughs> <laughs> what to do? What to do? Well, well, we'll try to get through these facts as quickly as possible. But we're going to start with the 65 facts that are found on IMDb. Let's see if any of these are actually true. So I'm going to read off the fact, and then I will go to Kelly and Nathan, and ask them whether or not they think it is true or false. Can we also say mostly true or mostly false? <laughs> that is true. They, you may do that. Mostly true okay. or mostly false. <laughs> and a partly cloudy or sunny or whatever. <laughs> okay. So let's start off with number one. Whenever somebody says something that could be interpreted as being a dirty joke, Yako blows a kiss to the audience and says, Good night, everybody. Who, who answers first? Oh, I'm sorry. We'll start with you, Nathan. Um, I'm going to say mostly false. I don't know. Every time, that's like, it's just false. And Kelly, what do you think? <laughs> Telling is every time, but a lot. Mostly. Right. Tom? I think both your answers are correct. Because oh, right. the, the problem with the statement is whenever someone says it, uh, that's just not the case. Yes. Because uh, weird, weird sort of off-color things get said all the time. So uh, Yakko is very selective in in when he goes, good night, everybody. (laughs) It would get pretty old if he did it every single time, I would think, also. (laughs) 
the good night everybody show yeah i mean weird he might not even be in the scene he just pops in and says good night everybody (laughs) one of the best um uh you know alludes uh, references to the audience right there of breaking the fourth wall of course is the fingerprints with dot just saying i don't think so i mean you didn't (laughs) need to put an you know good night everybody right there yeah and that he didn't do it there no 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 yep so number two the Good Feathers, a satire of the Warner Brothers film Goodfellas, 1990, were made to reflect the personalities of the film's main stars. Bobby, the Blue Pigeon, is meant to be Robert De Niro. Pesto, the Purple Pigeon, is meant to be Joe Pesci. And Squit, the Gray Pigeon, is meant to be Ray Liotta. Also, the God Pigeon is a take on Marlon Brando from The Godfather, 1972. What do you think? Um, I'm going to say true, although I'm trying to think of the pigeons colors <laughs> <laughs> so he's just saying all true kelly it's all true yeah i think it's true ding 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 correct very good excellent excellent that big buzzard was just threatened by our acting versatility and our good looks right yeah get used to it us stars gotta put up with stuff like this all the time hey bobby knows this industry <laughs> what I do. Not then. I just felt like whacking something. This next one right here says is is a topic of importance, of course, to Kelly, because it says executive producer Steven Spielberg came up with the idea to have an original musical score in every episode. Uh, Kelly, for this case, let's go with you first. I think that's true. All right, Nathan? I'll say it's false. <laughs> just to, just to just, be different? Yeah, maybe I can start winning. <laughs> and uh, the answer is Nathan is correct. Oh yes. no! Because you see, and and it's really a, it's sort of in the way the the statement is written. But executive st- uh, producer Steven Spielberg came up with the idea. The fact is, we came up with the idea of doing a full score back in Tiny Toons days, and uh, I wanted it. Everybody wanted it. Stephen wanted it. So we all wanted it. So this wasn't a new idea for Animaniacs uh, original musical score. This was just continuing the process. So I'd say the statement is basically false. All right. Next we have, during the theme song, the characters proudly announced that we have pay or play contracts. This is a Hollywood term, meaning the performer is paid whether or not he or she plays. This was a big deal in the days of contract studio players. Uh, Kelly, let's go to you once again. Do you think that's true or false? Um, I think it's, it's false because I don't think they get paid whether or not they play. I think they only get paid if they play. Hmm. Okay, Nathan, what do so you it's think? It's phrased weirdly, I think. It um, is phrased I'm, weirdly. I'm going to say it's true. I think they do get paid whether they play or not. All right. And I think the rest is right. I don't know. <laughs> well, Tom would know because, of course, he was the, you know, being the producer and everything of the show. Uh, were the Warners, were, was like Minerva Mink, for example. She wasn't in that many episodes. <laughs> was she paid even in the episode she was not actually playing on screen? Well, let's keep in mind, this is a lyric from a song. So <laughs> there's no, sorry, any truth to anything here. Uh, we have pay or play contracts. Uh that that's what the characters are saying, but that's not in fact how they were being paid, uh, because they're just cartoon characters. The reason there's this the answer to this question is false. It is not true, and there's a reason. There's only one part of it that's not true, and uh, it's that this was a big deal in the days of contract studio players. This actually did not exist during the days of studio contract players. This is the payer play started in the 80s and 90s, and the contract studio players were in the 30s and 40s. That's the mistake here. Yeah, uh, when Judy Garland would just work for MGM or something like that, and that's yeah, she it. Would right? get, she would get uh, put on suspension for not playing, you know, and she mm-hmm. would not get paid. So they didn't have it back then. Uh-huh. Okay. Next fact, 
the Pinky in the Brain sketch titled Animaniacs, Ups and Downs, the brave little trailer, and Yes Always, was taken almost verbatim from a recording of Orson Welles during a commercial and berating the director and his suggestions for Welles' delivery. In this recording, Welles uses some rather bad language, which was changed for the sketch. So, Kelly, what do you what do you think? Well, just the yes always was taken from the Orson Welles sketch. You you mentioned ups and downs and everything, and that that wasn't taken from Orson Welles. So, okay. partly true. <laughs> Nathan, yeah, I'm gonna agree. I'm just gonna say false because uh, it's not a pinky in the brain sketch that whole thing you named <laughs> and uh that's an animaniacs episode and the sketch itself uh is based on the orson well so uh, i don't know what that means but <laughs> yep you're you're both correct and that that's really i'd say that a lot of the little entries here on the imbd those are the, that's the kind of problem that exists where it's just it's not too uh carefully worded so they so there are mistakes it is open for anybody to put in their their own facts. That's that's the <laughs> great thing. That's the funny thing with IMDb. You know, um, th- for years people would and people still do this. By the way, I saw an Animaniacs movie that somebody had put in there with, and they went ahead and put uh, you know the voice actors in and 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 uh, Tom is the the producer and everything like that. That was weird, wasn't it? It was weird, but that is the. That's the type of fandom that sometimes does that stuff. I don't know. There's just some people that like doing that. Anyway, next fact. After all the characters were created, they were shown to executive producer Steven Spielberg for final approval. Buttons and Mindy were chosen by his daughter. Uh, Nathan, let's start with you. Um, I'm going to say mostly true. I think Mindy was chosen by the daughter. So that's, I don't know. That's what I'm saying. All right, Kelly, what about you? I know it was one of the kids. Um, I'm I'm gonna say true. All right, Tom. Well, this is uh, this is uh, an interesting question or interesting statement, and it's I think this is the first time uh, it's ever been absolutely clearly uh, stated. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to state this clearly because I actually went online last night and I saw pictures of all Stephen's kids, and I can report to you tonight the true information here <laughs> after all the characters were created they were shown this is at steven's house uh to executive we had them all laid out all these different character groups and everything and steven had already eliminated many and buttons so uh kate and the family the kids all came in uh, i think after shopping and they all kind of barged in and there kids everywhere and theo a toddler at the time walked up to Mindy and said, I like her. And we all turned to Steven and he said, Mindy and Buttons are back in. <laughs> and that's how Mindy and Buttons made it onto the show. I love you, bye-bye. There we go. So so Theo, that was one of the sons then, right? Or is that- Man, I missed a couple of Spielberg questions. Y'all have to <laughs> revoke my card. But... but, but no, I don't know how anyone would have known that except the three or four people that were in the room and of course Theo and the family. Yeah. Right. Right. I think Kelly just assumes everything she hears about Steven is true. So I think that's <laughs> no, <laughs> that is true. not true. Well, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go to the next one here. Writer and producer Sherry Stoner created Slappy the Squirrel after her friend and fellow writer, John P. McCann made fun of her career playing troubled teenagers. McCann said she'd probably be playing troubled teens into her 50s. So she went the other direction and created an older person acting like a teenager. Uh, let's go with Kelly first. Huh. Um, some of that doesn't sound familiar because I know we've heard this story <laughs> before. So I'm going to say it, it fault or, or I just forgot a bunch of it. <laughs> Nathan, what do you think? I'm going to say false. It's a character that's based off her improv uh, shows and she was much younger, right? So, right? Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think you're both correct. Uh, <laughs> there, there, there are lots of little uh, parts of this that are true. John McCann did make fun of Sherry playing troubled teenagers. And at some point he did joke, you know, you'll probably be playing troubled teenagers until you're an old woman. And uh, 
So I, she went in another direction, created an older person acting like a teenager. I don't, I, I don't know what that even means. Uh, <laughs> Sherry, you know, she had this voice that she used for Slappy that was very much from her improv uh, performance days and for, with which she was very comfortable, as we all know. Yeah. So, so good, to, good, good answers, everybody. I have to repost that. I think uh, uh, on our Facebook page, we, we found some of the some footage of her uh, in her improv days doing the slappy, that slappy uh-huh. voice nice. that we're, we're familiar with. And it's just, it's so, so great seeing her actually doing it in, well, for a different character, but it's such a great voice. Slappy Weiner, you had that wonderful success in the 50s, so famous on the television show. That Dawn Twin. The Twins. Everybody loved the Twins. We did six episodes. So you used the screen splitter on the Twin show. No, no. See, on our show, we couldn't afford that kind of split screen thing. So uh, the writers would have to come up with different plot devices. Like uh, one week, the one twin would be on vacation. The next week, a twin would be locked in a closet that, you know, kind of like. Sure. And for the record, uh, Earl Cress was involved in the the creation of this character because uh, we uh, wanted um, he he came up with an idea of doing a really old uh, squirrel. It was like screwy squirrel grown old. Mm. But uh, Sherry was, of course, the way to uh, get to the truth of Sloppy Squirrel. All right, Jess Harnell modeled Wacko's voice after Ringo Starr of the Beatles. He originally modeled the Liverpudlian accent after John Lennon, but he decided to go with Ringo instead because Wacko was shorter than the others. Wow. (laughs) Kelly, what do you think? So Ringo is shorter. I get it. Uh, Again, this is, I mean, I the part about being shorter, I I don't know if I've ever heard that, so I'm going to say false. (laughs) Nathan, what do you think? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna say false. I I think it is based off Ringo, but I don't know about the reasoning or that he originally did John Lennon or whatever. Yeah. So, and Tom, what do you, you recall? Both, you are both correct. All hey. right. Yeah, Jess Harnell modeled Wacko's voice after Ringo Starr, and uh, he had in the audition he had he had done the voice as Ringo as John as as Paul, as George. He did. He can do all four differently. And uh, Ringo was the appealing, cute, adorable one. Uh, and uh, he originally modeled the, the accent after John Lennon. That's just, that's just completely incorrect, that part. Yep. All right, next fact. The show, during its initial run, was more popular with teenagers and adults than children. This became a problem as the WB always placed it inside their quote-unquote Kids WB programming block, which eventually caused the series to be canceled as sponsors of the block felt uneasy about footing the bill for an audience to whom they couldn't sell products. All right, uh, Nathan, let's start with you this time. Uh, I'll say false. I don't I mean... Uh, I, I'm sure there's things false in that. It wasn't always on the WB, so it couldn't have always been on the kids' WB. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I was a kid, and I liked the show, so, yeah, there we go. False. Okay. Kelly, what do you think? I would say false also. All right. Tom, what do you, what, what's the verdict? I, I would agree with both of you. Uh, that it's just... It's sort of the way this whole thing is worded. It's, there's just so many sort of little avenues this this statement goes down that aren't quite correct so yeah was that ever a concern though with the, with the wbs the, them saying that we're not getting we're getting too many adults watching this show or is well it's not really that they don't mind getting lots of adults that but they were selling the the commercial time to ch- children's advertisers so uh i don't think they objected to high adult ratings uh, they just wanted higher children's ratings. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, the next fact right here says the water tower where the Warners live and many other features of the Warner Brothers lot 
are rather accurate representations of the lot in Burbank, California, although the real water tower is all gold, not red on top. And right now it's blue with, I don't know, they, they keep, they've changed it up a few times. But uh, what do you think, Nathan? Um, I, I'll just say false because the water tower is not gold. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Kelly, what do you think? I knew that. That's right. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a good, good fact or possible fact. Um, I, true. All right. So we got a true and we got a false. Tom, what do we, what's the verdict here? Well, I think the verdict is, uh, well, it does mimic it, the water tower is accurate and the top of the tower is a different color. So I think you're both correct in your responses. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. yeah. <laughs> we did. I forgot to mention in our, our recent talk with uh, Paul about uh, hearts of twilight, that the map that is represented on when uh, plots is saying, we're going to go from here to here. I said, you know what? I'm going to see how accurate this map actually is. So I pulled up the lot of Burbank, the Burbank lot, and I was like, wow, it actually does match up with uh, what Plots is pointing at. So uh, the, the, the route doesn't really make sense. <laughs> no, it's, the route doesn't make any sense. But <laughs> the buildings for the most of the much of the yeah. major lot uh, buildings were actually there, which was cool to see. All right. Uh, moving on to the next one right here. Uh, we have... The shape, I like this one a lot, <laughs> if this is real. The shape of Dot's head mimics the shape of the Warner Brothers Shield logo. Uh, well, Kelly, what do you think? I mean, a little bit, but I, I don't think that was necessarily intentional, so I'm going to say false. Nathan? Um, I'm going to say true, but be only because it doesn't say it intentionally mimics the shape of the Warner Brothers. Head. <laughs> I also agree it was not intentional, but uh, it somewhat looks like it, I guess. Again, I think you're both right. I mean, <laughs> Ellie said, "Yeah, but it wasn't intentional. It wasn't. It was not intentional." And the dot's head shape is similar to the shape of the shield, but. Probably the word mimics isn't quite right. I don't think she's mimicking it. Yeah, you didn't have that in mind when designing the the character. It was... Yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, the wheel and morality segments were created to fill time when an episode was running short. Uh, Nathan, what do you th what do you say? Um, I think they were created to be funny and to be enjoyable things. <laughs> <laughs> Tom likes that answer. Okay, I don't think that was the purpose. So, yeah. <laughs> Kelly, what about you? I, I think that's true. Uh, I think that's partly why they were created was to fill in some time, but also they they were funny. All right, Tom. What do you what's what do you say? Um, yeah, I don't think they were created to fill time. Uh, they were they were created uh, modularly. We created them all at once, and uh, we were going to have them maybe in every show. So they didn't necessarily they weren't there to fill in uh, fill in time they what happened was they they were too long <laughs> to be used enough <laughs> we had a lot of answers that we could plug in so uh but uh as you might remember the the whole show we didn't organize the show as half hours we we just made a bunch of shorts and then we just like checkerboarded them like a puzzle we put them together so uh so they were really uh created to entertain yeah, I think it was a great parody of the of the lessons that you would see at the end of G.I. Joe or He-Man or She-Ra or things like that as well. Those were always so Oh yeah, He-Man. That's right. Kids don't don't play with firecrackers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All those great things at the end of the I have a question. I was thinking about Wacko's Wish the other day. Did we actually pull in the wheel of morality at the end of Wacko's Wish? Yes, right at the end. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm glad we did. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was a nice little way to, to wrap up. Uh, Never give up hope. That's yes, right. exactly. So this next fact I thought was pretty interesting, if this is true. Deanna Oliver came up with an idea for a gecko character that eventually became the Geico gecko. Uh, Nathan, what do you think? Um, I'm True. I mean, I don't know. I think she's talented. I, I don't know. <laughs> she does like making... Uh, animal characters uh kelly what do you think 
I have no idea. So I'm just going to go with opposite of Nathan and say false. All right. Tom? I so wish this was true because <laughs> then maybe Deanna would be like this super powerful advertising uh, dynamo and, you know, on the world. Uh, Deanna Oliver did indeed come up with an idea for a gecko character. Uh, it was called uh, Gecko and Chuck Walla was the name of the duo. And uh, I think we even drew something uh, for those two characters, but they did not make uh, the first cut. And, uh, you know, that's so if Joey drew a gecko character someday, <laughs> some in his life at some point, I think we could say that Joey, Joey's gecko character eventually became the gecko gecko. Exactly. <laughs> well, I think I think Deanna should uh, should cite this as a source and and uh, file a claim against Geico. She could really make out. I like that. That's beautiful. <laughs> insurance against that. Exactly, yeah. boy. Oh, boy. No. So unfortunately, that I I don't think that's true. Uh, it's not. But sorry, Deanna. <laughs> yeah. sorry. Sure, Deanna wishes it was true. Yeah. Well, this next one I thought was was quite interesting, and I've seen this listed in some other uh, websites as well, that Sir Patrick Stewart was considered for the role of the brain, but he was busy acting as Captain Jean-Luc Picard on Star Trek The Next Generation at the time. So is that true, Nathan? I mean, was he considered? Uh, I don't even know what goes into considering someone, so I'll say true. Like, oh, yeah, we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> And Kelly, what about you? What do you think? Um, I'm just going to go the other direction again and say false. Because I, I really can't see him even being the brain, but maybe they, there was some remote consideration at one point. All right, Tom, what do you say? Um, you know, I wish I could answer this properly. I, I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure this is false. However, you know, uh, maybe somebody said at some point, well, you know what, you know, maybe uh, Patrick Stewart would be good. And other people said no. And that might, does that count? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I know that uh, the brains, ro the role of the brain was pretty much locked up after the very first audition uh, of Maurice LaMarche. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so. Yeah. And you shared that audition audio with us and it, it he really did sound like he nailed it from the first take. Like it was, it sounds ex exactly the way. Uh, yes. It always. <laughs> <laughs> I'm past that. Yes. Gee, brain. No, what do you want to do tonight? Same thing we do every night. Pinky. Try to take over the world. Well, let's go to the next one. I think you kind of alluded to this one here before, Tom. It says, Slappy Squirrel was originally an older version of Squirry, Screwy Squirrel, but the creators couldn't get the rights. Sherry Stoner liked the idea of an aged cartoon character because an aged cartoon star would know the secrets of other cartoons and, quote-unquote, have the dirt on them. Stoner's voice for the character impersonates Penny Marshall. Uh, there's a lot of different things that they're... I think they're two, two or three votes on this you know, yes, no, yes, yes. <laughs> right? yeah so let's let's start with is it uh slappy is an older version of screwy squirrel but they wanted to do an older version of screwy squirrel but they couldn't get the rights let's start with that one nathan yes no um i'll say no and kelly no and tom what is what's the what's let's you are start both, with that you are both correct uh we we did not want to get the rights to screwy squirrel we, we we wouldn't you know we didn't need to get screwy squirrel you know okay yeah. all right and so uh is that sherry liked the idea of a aged cartoon star because she would have uh dirt on the, or secrets and other cartoon characters uh what do you think about that uh nathan sure why not <laughs> say mostly true i don't know somewhat true <laughs> kelly i think it's true you're both Right. I mean, um, sure. I mean, sure. Sherry <laughs> has certainly taken the whole concept of, you know, he reminds me of a very young Peter Potamus. I mean, she's done that sort of stuff a lot. So I think having the dirt on the characters was appealed to her. <laughs> now, is she, and let's see, is she impersonating Penny Marshall? 
Uh, Nathan, what do you think? Um, not directly. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Kelly, yeah. what do you think? I don't think so. No. Uh, Tom, what do you say? You guys are good. You're correct all, all around. <laughs> I don't. I don't ever recall Penny Marshall's name uh, being uh, brought up, vis-a-vis uh, Slappy. All right. Okay. This next fact I've seen in a couple places as well. When Tom Ruger created Buster Bunny for Tiny Toon Adventures, he wanted to create a a catchphrase to parallel Bugs' "What's up, Doc?" and all he could think of was the old Valvillian standby, "Hello, Nurse." But that made no sense for the character. So now the phrase is used by Yakko and Wacko when greeting Dr. Scratch and Sniff's attractive assistant or any desirable woman. Uh, Nathan, what do you think? Um, I think true, although also Dot says hello news uh, sometimes. <laughs> okay, Kelly? Um, I will be true, too. All right, Tom, what do you say? Did, was this gonna be, Was this going to be Buster's catchphrase if, originally? Uh, y- yes, it was invented in the manner in which they describe it. However, the reason I say that, you know, this, this statement is not fully true is uh, they say uh, all I could think of apparently was the old bud, billion standby, hello, nurse. <laughs> so my, my uh, question to this, whoever wrote this statement is, Please, can you show me anywhere in the history of vaudeville where anyone ever said, hello, nurse, because (laughs) it literally uh, doesn't exist. So, I mean, yes, there were nurse sketches in vaudeville, but hello, nurse was not a catchphrase that uh, it was literally, you know, what's up, doc? Hello, nurse. That's the connection. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, that did seem a little off. Like, okay, like, sure, buddy. Uh, <laughs> anyway. But I'm giving you both a, a point for that. Okay. Uh, okay, moving on. Pinky and the Brain are caricatures of Tiny Toon Adventures storyboard artist and writer Eddie Fitzgerald and writer, staffer, and storyboard artist Tom Minton, respectively. Kelly, what do you say? Um... Trying to think back that far when we talked about all this. I think that's true. Okay. Nathan? Uh, yeah, I'll say true. That way, at least I don't lose points if it's. <laughs> <laughs> and right, Tom? Uh, Joey, any thoughts? I, I think, okay, I know that my, my, my recollection that, yes, Eddie Fitzgerald and Tom Minton both look and sound uh, like Pinky in the Brain, uh, but I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure about the storyboard artist aspect of, of some of this stuff, but uh, that, that's where I kind of am a little unsure. Perfectly <laughs> correct. All right. hundred <laughs> percent. I didn't, I didn't realize that um, they actually did storyboards as well for the show. So that's... yes, they were all, uh, uh, and Eddie was also a director uh, mm-hmm. of tiny tunes. All right. Going down the list a little bit, we have a next one here. It says the character of Minerva Mink was scaled back because the network censors deemed her too sexually suggestive for the show's intended audience. Uh, Nathan, what do you say? I'm going to say false. I don't think it was the censors that scaled her back. Um, Yeah. All right. Uh, Kelly, what do you say? I I agree that um, it wasn't the censors. Okay, Tom. You are okay. correct. You are both correct. Uh, it was uh, both Gene McCurdy and Stephen. But yeah, let's let's focus on the other characters. This uh, Minerva's maybe too Marilyn Monroe like for our intended audience. I know there was some some cleavage that was erased from some shots of Minerva. Uh, was that was that Gene McCurdy saying to, to get rid of that, or was that a censors uh, thing? Do you remember? She may have had a, a conversation with the network, but I know that Gene said, "You know, you got to pull this back." So mm-hmm. he went through a few shots, and the poor folks at uh, Star Tunes had to go in there and scrape off some uh, Xerox black lines <laughs> to cut down the cleavage. All right, uh, let's go to now. 
this is I don't know about this one right here. So I'm going to ask you this one. Throughout the series, Dot Warner's voice gets slightly deeper each episode. And it is also evident in the movie Animaniacs Wacko's Wish. This was Tress McNeil's idea, as she thought it would be a good idea to have the Warners age and have Dot go through puberty. <laughs> Nathan, what do you... I'm sorry, I couldn't even read that one. <laughs> Straight face. Nathan, what do you think? Obviously, it's 100% true. <laughs> <We> all... <laughs> no, I'm going to say false. <laughs> Kelly, what do you say? Uh, false. Okay, Tom. That sounds right to me. False sounds correct. Uh, I, I I don't even know how that would be possible. That would mean <laughs> that Tress McNeil literally had Dot's voice down to, she would have 100 different settings of highness, lowness in her voice ranges for Dot for her to get slightly deeper each episode. She would also <laughs> need to know which order the episodes would go in when I mean, <laughs> when recording. We didn't even know that when you were creating these segments, <laughs> like which episode this would go to. So yeah, I, and, and the fact that this would be a, a sign of her showing uh, her puberty, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm stymied. <laughs> well, you know, I think any any difference in sound, I think people might hear from the characters might just be because the characters. I think you you alluded before, Tom, to just the pitching there was some pitching initially with tress's uh performance but then as she, you know, as the show went on she just kind of learned to kind of like pitch it up herself is that right very true that's very true even i think initially we were fiddling with rob's voice uh, yes yeah pitching, and eventually he just we'd play it back to him and he just assumed that voice range and it uh, worked yeah that's something I never noticed in, really until uh, working on the podcast and you, you just hear the audio by itself. And then you can start to hear, oh, wait, this voice has been pitched slightly. Uh, whereas um, just watching the show, you don't notice it at all. Well, well so if you listen to uh, uh, the, the Dracula cartoon, um, which is called what? Dracula, Dracula. Dracula. Sorry. Yes. Dracula, Dracula. Uh, Rob's voice uh, for Yaka there is it's a little bit nasally too. He he in those first couple of cartoons he 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 really put it up in his nose and he he dropped that pretty fast. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, this next one right here I thought it was uh, an interesting thing because uh, we stopped seeing Rita and Runt as much as the as the series progressed. So this one says Rita and Runt were phased out of the series because Bernadette Peters was getting too expensive to hire. Kelly, what do you think? I don't think that's true. All right. Nathan, what do you say? I'll say false. I think she just got too busy. Got too hard to schedule, I think, would be the more thing. I don't know. All right, Tom, what what what's the deal? Oh, what's what's you're, you're no both Rita? correct. Uh, she was not they were not phased out because Bernadette was too expensive. Uh, if you'll, you know, all the actors received, uh, I, I know for the first season, they all received the same fee for everything, you know, whatever they were doing. In other words, if they appeared in a cartoon, they got paid to appear in that cartoon. If they didn't appear, they, they didn't get paid. Um, Bernadette wasn't in that many cartoons, as you know, you know, what, 15, the whole run, I don't know, 20. But uh, by no means that was that series ever ever officially faded out it wasn't phased out we just the writers just didn't focus on those characters because they were too interested in focusing on the other characters yeah well also it seems like creating a read and run segment would also take a lot more effort as well with the with the songwriting and everything as well it would i don't know it just seems like it's a it's a harder endeavor in some ways also, there's a tone thing with Rita and Runt. There's a there's a certain um, I don't know. There's a, some pathos in the Rita and Runt cartoons. Mm -hmm. There's uh, perhaps more drama in those cartoons than uh, just out and out comedy. And I think a lot of the writers on our team just really like to go for the jokes. And Rita and Runt uh, probably had a little bit fewer jokes. All right. Uh, I'm going to move down just a little bit more here. 
to this next uh, th- fact that I thought you might be able to, to clear up. Dot was modeled on, among others, Gilda Radner. All right. Nathan, what do you think? Is uh, Gilda Radner uh, an influence on Dot's character? No. I'm going to say no. Uh, it's a WB icon. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and Kelly, what do you think? Uh, um, mm, that's a tough one. Uh, maybe a little. All right. Tom, what, what, was Gilda Radner in your head when you were putting Dot's character together? No. No. <laughs> no, Gilda Rad- I mean, we all love Gilda Radner, but I, I just don't see that as being part of the process. Next fact right here. The CEO, Thaddeus Plotz's last name, is Yiddish for explode. Um, Nathan, what do you think? How's your Yiddish? Um, plots means to throw down in Yiddish. You plots it, and that's that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> All right, Kelly, what do you think? Oh, I know plots means sit in German, according to the lady who helped us instruct our German shepherd. Um, so, uh, but I don't know about Yiddish. Um, no. False. Okay, Tom. You're both right. I, I don't think um, I'm positive that Thaddeus Plot's name in Yiddish means explode. It, it doesn't mean that. It means, as, as Nathan indicated, to faint or collapse or sit down or... Nice. I was just guessing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, Very I got... I heard I, in the producers, Mel Brooks, the producers, the musical, there's a line, uh, we'll dr- we'll, and we'll drink schnapps till we plots or something like that. And I just yeah. say, oh, of course, yeah. context clues doesn't mean explode. <laughs> so, but uh, any idea who, uh, the, the name though, uh, Thaddeus Plots, like how, d- how did that name, do you have any reference of how that name came about though, Tom? Yes. Uh, um, I originally called it Thaddeus Putts. <laughs> and uh, someone uh, above me said, no, that means like uh, uh, maybe your butt or your other male part. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, we went with, then we switched it to yuts. And there was a problem with yuts. For, and, and ultimately, uh, plots didn't create any havoc. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, Yiddish words are just, there's a lot of funny sounding Yiddish words, too. They're beautiful. Just, That's a it's beautiful sounding word. I love, oh, man, just gorgeous. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Uh, this this is another one, I, again, I, I've seen a couple times, that the Sherry Stoner invented Dot's full name, Princess Angelina Contessa, Louisa Francesca, Banana Fanta Bobesca the Third, using the song The Name Game by Shirley Ellis, and also patterned it off of uh, Pippi Longstocking's full name, which of course was Pippi Lada Delicatessa Window Shade Macromet Ephraim's daughter's Longstocking. So, Nathan, what do you what do you think? Um, I think it's true. I know the name game did play a role in it. I haven't never heard the Pippi Longstocking, but um, that sounds true. Sure. All right, uh, Kelly. What about you? Yeah, that sounds right. All right. I, I have my I know own. the name game. <laughs> okay. I don't know about Pippi Longstocking. Well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna put out my theory, and I'm gonna say this is false. And Tom, you can. I know I shouldn't be I shouldn't be participating because I'm the person asking oh, questions. But here's the thing. Uh, in the name game, uh, Shirley Shirley Boberly, Shirley Shirley Boberly, Banana Fana Boberly. So Banana Fana is from the name game. Right. That's it. <laughs> As for Pippi Longstocking, not involved in this. I, I went. I, I Sherry and I were working on uh, the Bible for the different characters. I said we should name. We should have Da. I, I, I said Da should have a really fancy name that she likes to say. Because my dad had a name for his dog that he went on. It was Luigi Vegetables, Penelope Rover, Rover, Pompanata, You go, I go. We all go. Yugoslavia, George Webster, George Washington, Ouchie McOuchie. <laughs> so I, I, I said I explained that to her, and she said, "What? Wait, what?" And she started writing stuff down. And uh, so I think 
my dad's neighbor's dog was one of the inspirations for this. Uh, that's that's where I think, and I, I don't know if Pippi Longstocking came into to no. that at all. I, I no, look at that name. That's a tough name. Pippi, yeah. What the? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we're still waiting for uh, Plucky to be included in the name game, but uh, <laughs> we, 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 I don't think we'll ever hear that. Um, okay. The, the Animaniacs theme song uh, is a satire of This Is It <laughs> from the theme song, The Bugs Bunny Show. Uh, this is it. You know that song, I believe. Yeah. For example, Bugs and Company sing, no more nursing, rehearsing a part. We know each, we know each part by heart. Now, that part. The Animaniacs sing, the writers flipped, we have no script. Why bother to rehearse? Um, Nathan, what do you think? <laughs> I'm just going to say false. I don't know how that came i don't know i don't see the connection okay kelly what do you what do you say yeah i I say false too all right tom you are correct however i'm gonna throw other one what what connection does the anime x theme song actually have and i'll say it's a visual connection the anime x theme song to the bugs bunny show theme song yes because they kind of come out in the same way of kind of marching, right? Yeah. That last shot where they're kind of walking across the stage is really, that is a parody of the Bugs Bunny show. Theme. Yeah. I, I don't know why the writer of this decided to pick out the writers flipped that, that sp- specific part right there, because yeah, that I think is, the word rehearse is in both. So they felt, no. oh, rehearse, rehearse. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. There we go. So by the way, if there's any editors out there that like to edit IMDb, please edit these. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just delete them. Just, I don't know. what. <laughs> <laughs> the Warner siblings are based in a roundabout way on the senior producer, Tom Ruger's three real life children. Originally, they were going to be ducks named Yaki, Smacky, and Wacky. But this idea was canned. It was thought to be too similar to DuckTales. And the three were changed into Platypi and then into Bosco Light like ink blots. Along the way, they gained a female friend. Finally, Yaki became Yakko, Smacky became Wacky, or Wacko, whatever. And the. Well, Yaki, Wacky became Wacko, and the female friend was named Dot, and then they made her the sister. Um, okay, that's a lot of very specific things going on right there. But Nathan, what do you say? Um, I think mostly true. There's a lot there, so it's gonna. Just, <laughs> I wouldn't surprise me if there's things that are false in that, but I think mostly true, if not all. All right, Kelly. Um. Maybe about 50-50. Okay. Uh, Tom, what do you say? Yeah, I think I think you're both right. Um, I'd say the thing that's like completely incorrect was uh, the original drawings were based on some platypi drawings I had. Not uh, the platypi aspect to it doesn't happen in the middle. Like in other words, originally they were going to be ducks, right? Well. That's where the platypi drawings were used uh, and, and made them ducks. So it went from them being ducks to them being Bosco-like characters. So that's 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 one of the little errors in there. So what about the, this thing about Ducktales? Yeah, was, that's what I was thinking. That wasn't true. Is that not true? The, yeah, I don't recall Ducktales ever being mentioned. I know that Stephen Stephen said there are too many ducks on TV. We don't need any more ducks. So that's really the reason we dumped the whole duck concept. Who are you? We're the Warner Brothers. And the Warner sister. Okay. Uh, The writers phased the hip hippos out of the series when they proved unpopular with viewers. Is that why we didn't see hip hippos? Do you getting feedback from kids saying no more hip hippos? (laughs) Uh, Let's go with Nathan. I'm going to say false. I think it's, again, the writers didn't want to write for the hip hippos. <laughs> so they were never phased out, but yeah. Kelly, what do you say? Oh, um, I'll say it's true. All right. Tom? Uh, in this case, uh, I think Nathan is uh, correct. Uh, they were, the writers just couldn't muster the energy to write for the hip hippos. So that's why they... <laughs> They didn't continue. 
Uh, yeah, you, you know, it's like you were saying, they, it, it, you need the warners there with if you're going to have two, you know, people acting like stuck up and everything like that. Yeah, why did we ever do that? I, you okay. know, the it, best it, the brain crossover. The, yeah. That was the best one, in my opinion, was when the brain was uh, there. The closest I think we ever got to the Warners being with uh, with uh, the Hip Hippos was in Star Warners for the, when he was uh, the Flabby the Butt or whatever it was. Didn't he cut? Didn't one of the hippo, Hip Hippos come in when we were visiting, um, like Iraq, and he was like uh, he was playing the role of Skippy. Oh yes, I'm Sloppy. <laughs> yeah. See, that mm-hmm. was good. And that was good. Stops. Dot was playing Slappy, and Slappy was playing Dot. I don't there know. There you go. Yes. See, they, they have their moments, but yes, they, they uh, yeah, well, moving on. Let's let's go down just a little bit. At one point, the introduction of a fourth Warner named Lacko was considered. He would have been the straight man of the team, modeled after Zeppo Marx. The, anime, the Animaniacs film from which he was developed was Wandering Warner's Wii, which never made it past the development stage. So was there going to be a fourth Warner sibling? Nathan, let's start with you. What do you think? Uh, that sounds too weird. I'm going to say false. <laughs> Kelly, what do you say? No, I don't think so. Okay. So we got two no's. Tom, was it true or false? There was not going to be a fourth Warner sibling. Uh, named Olaco. I think in the in we Paul Rugg and I worked on something called Wandering Warner's We, where they were uh, they were um, troubadours, um, and we did have another character we we're going to bring in named Laco, but we we pretty much wrote him out before uh, you know he it ever got anywhere. Mm. So. Uh, to say that Lacko never existed uh, is not right, but this this statement is it was never really seriously considered. Okay, so that'll wrap up the majority of those questions right there uh, off of <laughs> off of these the IMDb. You know, some of these are, are I think people are reaching uh, for for stuff, but we do have some questions right here for Tom, and we have quite a few, so we'll get to a few of them today, but we'll, we're going to hold on to a bunch of them because, um, Tom, of course, we're going to have you back on the show, Tom. Why not? If yeah. You'll, if you'll uh, have us. Edit me out a little, too. <laughs> <laughs> we edit you out of every episode we do. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, right. exactly. Like- Tom, you, many people don't know this, but Tom is actually on every single episode of the <laughs> Animaniacast, constantly talking in the background, <laughs> but we... we through my magic of editing, I'm able to mute him. Right. And, would, and he's actually, I, I, he, we call it directing. He's directing each podcast <laughs> episode. But it's just, you know. The world is a better place for your editing. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go to our Discord server. You can join the RetroZap Discord server by going to Discord dot animaniacast.com and then you can join the conversation over there. But we have this first question here from Yakomon. Uh, and Yakoman says, uh, I wanted to know if Variety Speak, Wacko's two-note song, and The Ballad of Magellan were intended to be theatrical shorts to follow up I'm Mad, and if so, what caused WB to backtrack on that idea? So I think some of these were maybe widescreen, perhaps, and maybe that's why uh, that's the initial thought. But uh, were these songs going to be theatrical shorts like i'm mad no <laughs> were there any plans to do any additional uh animaniac shorts uh or did that kind of just stop with i'm mad yeah i think warner brothers saw the uh this opening with uh one of their don bluth movies thumbelina i think it was and it was a little bit short maybe they figured they could slip in something in front of it and uh so uh, we did, I think we reshot I'm Mad so it would be widescreen, so it would work uh, in most of the projectors around America. So uh, we didn't, uh, if in fact it looks like those things are widescreen, it's just, uh, it's probably just some way that they got transferred that's not what we expected. Hmm, okay. not, they were not built for uh, theatrical use. 
Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Nathan Kelly, if you're going down the list, is there any uh, question that you see on there, Nathan, that you'd like to ask? Pick one at random. Sure. Like this one from Technotron. Was the episode One Flew Over the Cuckoo Clock an attempt to get Slappy Squirrel spinoff series greenlit? Uh, it certainly served that purpose and, and did not succeed. But uh, <laughs> we just thought we should do a long, a long story with Slappy. I'd say of, of, of all the cartoons I was pretty much involved with, uh, pretty deeply involved in uh, that one, um, Boy, did we get flack on that. Um, I had people, I had like executives coming to me saying, why are you making that? It's so sad. It's so depressing. And uh, I just, I thought it, it, I think the problem with it is that Slappy's recovery is somewhat miraculous and, uh, and somewhat arbitrary. And that's maybe why it doesn't work completely. Mm -hmm. Um, but it really, for me, it was about a relationship between uh, a little kid and a, a beloved older relative and how that relationship is important and sincere and means a great deal. And uh, that's where I was coming from. And I, I think it really, it was emotional. It was sort of Chaplin-esque in its pathos. And uh, I like it. There are people that really uh, are, are not in favor of that cartoon, but uh, I like it. The majority of people I see online have that really like that episode these days. I, I get a lot of, uh, you know, I see a lot of positive stuff about that episode. So I think it's, um, I think maybe at the time, if it wasn't received that well, well, it's definitely received well these days, I think. Um, that's a lot of that's, people love that's it. great to hear because, uh, yeah, it, it's probably not as funny as some of the cartoons, but I, I think it has a lot of heart. Mm -hmm. Oh, Nathan's performance in that is amazing. I think at the end when he's going starlight, star bright, I'm like, it really is. It it it's it's so cute and sad at the same time. But um, yeah, it's it's a different cartoon. It is definitely a different. Yeah, cartoon. It, it it definitely has you know with a social worker coming to get him, it has, it has some real trauma. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Well, uh, Kelly, is there a question or a uh, fact on here that you'd like to make sure we get cleared up? Uh, yes, I've got a question. This is from Sponge Fox on Twitter. Did Steven Spielberg actually draw stuff for Tiny Toons and Animaniacs? Uh, he would, we occasionally would have meetings with him, live meetings where we'd be in the conference room and we'd have uh, uh, storyboards there. And I recall him drawing one thing. We had this, and I think I've gone over this before, but we had this pan, right, on the page, on the first page of the, of the storyboard. It was like an establishing shot. And uh, it was a long pan. And it would take maybe, you know, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000. It might take five seconds to get across the pan and arrive at Mac, Montana Max's house, say. Uh, Stephen, I remember one day he said, I don't want to spend five, six seconds doing that. So he just took his pencil out and he, he drew like a really wide angle around this pan. So you would see everything in the pan in one frame and you could be on it two and a half seconds. So he, and by doing that, he, he maintained and, and uh, he established, a, I think, a quicker pace for the opening of that cartoon, which I think was right, because our cartoons had a quick pace. Speed is Spielberg. There was also a fact right here that was listed on an article that I got to know. Is it true that Steven Spielberg outlawed fat, fat jokes? Because Steven Spielberg saw positive body image. It was very important. And the joke about uh, body weight would be inappropriate. Yes, Steven outlawed fat jokes on the show. I think uh, in the Tiny Toons, uh, I think it was a Tiny Toons, it might have been um, the summer vacation, uh, how we spent our vacation. I think Roseanne was in that. Uh, yes. Fat, uh, um, excuse me, overweight Roseanne. <laughs> and I think she may have fallen off a balcony or something. So we saw that 
I remember watching it with him and he said, you know what? I think we should be done with the fat jokes. I don't think we should do any anymore. And uh, one or two might have snuck in uh, after that, but I remember that was the uh, that was the moment that we said, "Yeah, let's stop." Let's stop. Although we just uh, we're going to be reviewing uh, an episode of Freakazoid, uh, which includes the segment "Fat Man and Boy Blubber," so I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a different series. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of Fat Man and Boy Blubber sequels. No, there yeah. weren't. And no, they, no. they weren't totally made fun of. Uh, they, they, they were they're somewhat they're... respectful of them. Yeah, he, 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 he wanted to eat, the, the, he wanted to have snack on the kids' snacks, though. He said, come yeah. on, <laughs> let's have some of those, those Twinkies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was well, Mark, Mark Drotman played uh, that character, and he was a writer on Hysteria. Very funny man. Okay. Well, uh, I think I think it's time to wrap things up, I think, for today. But, of course, we're going to have Tom back on. And so if we did not get to your questions or anything, don't worry, folks. We will we'll be locking them in the vault in our own little water tower until our Tom's tardis. back on. And yes. Oh, should we talk about that? No, Nathan? we'll get it next time. This, we? we already know it's true, but okay. No. <laughs> okay, Nathan, go and tell him. I think it's time we tell. Tell this is a theory, by the way. Nathan came up with this theory, and I. It's it's, it's got to be true. But here we go. All right. So, uh, the Animaniacs are actually a spinoff of Doctor Who. The Warners are Time Lords who are able to travel back in time with the use of their TARDIS which looks like a water tower. Very good. And <laughs> they really do. They travel all through time. Uh, Space, yeah. Even forward. And uh, yeah, I, I, I like that. And I, I really think we are, we are, aren't we all secretly time traveling? Yeah. <laughs> We're just going one second at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that'll wrap it up for today. So let's go ahead and get to some contact information. Nathan, where can people find you online? Ooh, I'm on Twitter, Joey. Django FT, that's me. And Kelly, what about you? I'm also on Twitter, Yoda Princess, Y-O-D-A-P-R-N-C-S-S, or email me, Kelly, at BigShinyRobot.com. All right, Tom, where can people get in contact with you if they have any of these weird facts or questions? I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, uh... Uh, well, you can find me. I'm All right. He can be found. And, of course, the Animaniacast, we're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram as well. And, of course, you can see our full archive of episodes over at Animaniacast.com or your favorite podcast player. And speaking of podcasts, go ahead and subscribe to the Retro Zap podcast feed because that way you can not only get this podcast, but all the other great Retro Zap podcasts delivered straight to your device for free. Well, that'll do it for today's episode. So, for Nathan, Kelly, and Tom, this is Joey saying good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. This podcast is not endorsed by Warner Brothers or Amblin Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Animaniacs, Tiny Toon Adventures, Freakazoid, the Warner Brothers logo, all names, pictures, and sounds are registered trademarks and or copyrights of their respected trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the Animaniacast unless otherwise indicated. Isaac Newton. <laughs> uh, wait for the question. Isaac Newton? Uh, didn't you hear me? Yes, I did. Good answer!